Okay, here we go. We'll do the uh, video lecture for chapter 7 on metamorphism and metamorphic rocks. Now, keep in mind, uh, we're in a, the next part of the rock cycle, so we dealt with igneous rocks to begin with, and we went through sedimentary rocks, now we're into metamorphic rocks, the third type of rock. Um, your book has got a couple of great pictures of metamorphic rocks in particular. I really do like this one here on page, what is this, uh, 159. Uh, I happen to have a sample that looks remarkably similar to this, so uh, I happen to like it. So basically what is metamorphism? Metamorphism is the process by which we're going to change the nature of a rock. Basically, it's mineral composition, um, not necessarily its chemical composition, but just the composition of its minerals through a solid state process, meaning that the minerals will not melt. Now, we'll have fluids that will be involved in this, but the rock itself stays solid. <clears throat> so the primary thing is it's going to be based on pressure and temperatures that are different than the rock originally formed under. So that's really the key. We're talking about conditions that are dissimilar to the, what formed the rock in the first place. Now, like I, we said when we talked about the rock cycle, any rock can become any other rock. An igneous rock can become a metamorphic rock. A sedimentary rock can become a metamorphic rock. A metamorphic rock can become another metamorphic rock. Now, the, the interesting thing with metamorphic rocks, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the progress of metamorphism can be gradual or incremental, meaning that we can go from a low grade or barely metamorphosed rock to a high grade or highly metamorphosed rock. So we can see this happening and we can see these different stages. In fact, when we have mountain building events, we can get what are called regional zones of metamorphism. And these tend to be associated with large mountain building events. And we can actually watch the grade of metamorphism progress if we walk through the cores of those mountains. We can see it start from unaltered rocks that are bent and folded moving into low-grade metamorphism, medium-grade metamorphism, high-grade metamorphism, and then usually we go transition from high-grade metamorphism into igneous material, and then we'll transition back and follow the same pattern back outwards. So let's talk about the other settings. Now, of course, regional uh, metamorphism is the one that creates the biggest extent of metamorphic rocks, the biggest zone of them. Um, but it's not the only one. We also can have contact or thermal metamorphism. Contact metamorphism is very simple to understand, uh, very easy to understand. It's just heat. It's just from being in contact with something hot. So um, it could be like you have a hot iron and you set the iron down while it's too hot on the wrong material and that material change state from say a um, a soft fabric into a clump of plastic that would be a, a form of heat or contact metamorphism or thermal metamorphism generally speaking we see this in relationship to a lava flow that's flowing on the surface of the earth or with um, a magma body that's intruded into the country rock surrounding it. The other one is hydrothermal metamorphism. Um, this is chemical alterations that take place because of the presence of hot iron, ion rich waters. Um, really we see this primarily in areas of geothermal activity such as Yellowstone, um, anywhere you have a hot spring you can see this. The mid-oceanic ridge actually sees a lot of this because of hot water circulating in and out of the crustal rocks that are forming. So what are the agents of metamorphism? Well, there are a couple, and the first and uh, one of the more important ones is going to be heat. And why heat? Well, remember we said that heat is a measure of kinetic energy of the molecules. So what heat will do is it makes it 
easier for atoms and molecules and ions to move around within the material without the material actually having been melted. <clears throat> so it allows for the recrystallization of new uh, and more stable minerals, at least more stable for the environment that the rock finds itself in. Now, generally speaking, there are two sources of heat that a rock is going to experience as it's going through metamorphism. One is contact heat. So basically you have a magma body that's coming in close, close vicinity with the material and that transfers heat to it. The other is going to be just simply the fact that the deeper you go into the earth, as we mentioned before, the warmer it gets, the geothermal gradient. So that's going to increase the temperature in the earth, at least within the upper crust. Uh, the other Another primary component of metamorphism is going to be pressure. Now, we need to define pressure. Um, and your book kind of refers to it as a form of stress. That's a good way to put it. I, I want to define it a little differently. I want you to think of your tire. Yeah, your tire. Um, you, go to, you go to the gas station, your Maybe your tire pressure light is on, indicating that you've got low pressure in your tire. So you go and you check it out. <clears throat> and you find that the tire is low, so you put some more air in it. How do you measure that? Well, right, pounds per square inch. So pressure, a good way to think of pressure is it's a measure of force per unit area. Okay, Let's keep that in mind, force per unit area. This is going to come back, and we'll do some a little bit of math here, not a lot. We'll try to keep it simple, but let's keep thinking of it that way. Now, when it comes to types of pressure, there are actually two types. The first is what we call confining pressure. This is like the air pressure. So if I hold my hand out, okay, and if I could draw a diagram of air pressure, what I would see is little vectors of arrows all equal in size. And that's an interesting thing. In physics, we can use what we call a vector diagram. And the size of the vector indicates the size of the force that's being applied. So in the case of air pressure, no matter how I hold my hand, no matter the direction I'm looking, no matter the direction I'm my, of my skin is facing, the pressure is the same in all directions. And when the pressure is the same in all directions, that means we have a confining pressure. So it's equal in all directions. Um, one of the results of this, you can look this up, I think you can find this on YouTube, is uh, when they found the Titanic originally. Um, one of the people dealing with uh, finding the Titanic had a cage outside the submersible that found the Titanic. And in this they put a head. Now, they didn't cut somebody's head off and do that. If you're thinking that, okay, then whatever. But no, what they did is they took one of those mannequin heads that's made of styrofoam, the kind that you would see if you go to a wig shop. Um, or in some cases, you might see them at some Halloween stores to use to hold up a version of a mask so you can see what it would look like if it was on somebody's head. They took this styrofoam head in the cage down to the Titanic, thousands of feet below sea level. Tens of thousands of feet, I think, actually. When they came back up, the styrofoam head, which started out the size of an average human head, was about that big. It shrank. It was pressed in. But it shrank equally in all directions. So it was compressed completely, perfectly. So it was shrunk down perfectly. And that's, you can only do that with confining pressure. Now, uh, um, th another type of pressure we can have is called differential pressure. And that means that the pressure is different in different directions. And as we'll see in a little bit, this is actually going to create um, some very important features in the rocks. And I'll talk about this in, in a little bit when we get to talking about foliation. I'll draw a few examples for you. I do have a little whiteboard. And uh, we'll see what differential pressure can do. There's a couple of different types of differential pressure. But for now, let's just 
focus on the fact that we can have this differential pressure. Okay. The other factor already mentioned briefly is chemically active fluids. Now, the vast, the vast majority of the material making up the chemically active fluids is going to be, of course, water. But you're going to have other volatile compounds in there. You might have some carbon dioxide. You might have some sulfur dioxide. You might have some other compounds that are in solution. What makes this very important in metamorphism is that the chemically active fluid acts like a superhighway. Remember, heat lets the ions start to migrate around. But just like not having a good road network, you're not going to be able to go too far. I mean, imagine 100 years ago, yeah, pretty close to 100 years ago, actually, when the only thing around uh, to get you from Tucson to Phoenix or Phoenix to Flagstaff or Tucson to Nogales were dirt roads. And most of them were really not built, they were just kind of treaded out by animals, especially horses. Um, you try to drive one of the old cars along that, you're not going to be able to go very fast. Even the old cars, which can maybe hit top speeds of, say, 25 or 30 miles an hour, we're lucky if they could do 10 or 15. You build a real road, and those cars can move much further, much faster. Same thing with hydrothermal solutions or uh, chemically active fluids. They allow ions to move much further than they would be able to move with heat alone. So they aid in the recrystallization, which causes the minerals to grow larger. Uh, interestingly, if we have a compressional stress, i.e. a stress that is strong in one direction and not so strong in the other directions, then what will happen is it's going to cause the, cr the crystals to grow perpendicular to that strong compressive force. And we'll see why in just a little bit. Now, where does this water come from? Well, a couple of different places. It can be in the pore spaces of sedimentary rocks. It can be in the fractures of igneous rocks. Or it can be in hydrated minerals, such as clays or micas. So they have a little bit of water uh, trapped within their crystalline structure. Or in some cases, you can actually have pockets of water trapped in minerals like quartz. Now, generally speaking, when it comes to talking about metamorphic rocks and the type of metamorphic rocks, which we'll cover here shortly, one key factor above all else is in control. And that is what is the parent material? Okay. It's got to be the parent material because you're not going to really create something that much different from the parent material uh, when you're done with the metamorphism. So, for example, if I have limestone, which is made of mostly calcite, I'm not going to get a rock that we call a quartzite, which is made of mostly quartz. It's just chemically not going to happen. Instead, when I metamorphose limestone, I'm going to get marble. Okay? So the rocks are going to have essentially the same general chemical composition as the parent material that they started with. So while the mineral content might change, the chemical composition of the rock is pretty much going to stay close to the same, with the only difference being the loss or acquisition of volatile materials. And then generally speaking, um, the mineral content of the parent material is going to control to a large degree which of the metamorphic agents, the heat, the pressure, or the hydro, hydro um, thermal fluids or the chemically active fluids are going to cause changes to occur and how much change can occur. Okay. So let's talk briefly about textures. Again, we're gonna, we keep coming back to this with igneous rocks. We had all those different textures, aphanitic, phanaritic, pegmatitic, porphyritic, vesicular, glassy, etc. With the sedimentary rocks, we only had two, clastic or, or crystalline, or dryadal or crystalline. With metamorphic rocks, we have two, so nice and easy. Um, basically, our textures are non-foliated or foliated. Okay, non-foliated means not foliated. So let's 
figure out what foliation is. Basically, we're using this to talk about the generally the size, shape, but more importantly, the arrangement of mineral grains within the rock. So foliation has to do with the arrangement of the grains, the, the orientation of the grains, if you will. So to put it into an example for you, if I have a box, and in this box I throw, say, some coins as I'm, and I, in some sand and I mix it up. So I'm just going to draw some coin edges here. Maybe it looks something like this. Okay, so there's my box with the coin edges in it that we can see. This box is full of sand. And that's basically a random pattern. That would be a non-foliated pattern. Okay, but if I was to expose that box to some pressure in a specific direction, and let's say I do this pressure vertically, so I put a lot of pressure vertically on the box, what I'm going to end up with is something more like this. Those coins are going to end up all aligned. So what we mean by foliation is an alignment of mineral grains in a preferred direction or in a preferred plane of alignment. So the parallel alignment of platy or elongated minerals is an example of foliation. Uh, the parallel alignment of flattened mineral grains or pebbles is also a form of foliation. Another form that we can see is what we call compositional banding or mineral segregation. Um, in strong enough forms of metamorphism, mineral grains will actually migrate and segregate themselves based on their composition. In other words, the mafic minerals will all go and group together in bands of dark minerals, and the felsic minerals will all group together in bands of the light minerals, just like this rock in the book. Okay, So that's another form. The other thing that can happen is if we have a lot of those platy minerals, uh, think of them like pieces of, uh, or uh, yeah, pieces, uh, like playing cards that are laid out, and they all lay down in flat sections. You grab, no matter where you grab, you get a section that breaks apart perfectly across the, uh, across the flat face of one of those playing cards. And that actually we call slaty cleavage. So it's where rocks actually break, or rock cleavage. It's where the rocks actually break easily into these, along these planes of weakness that are formed by these platy minerals. So, why does foliation work? Well, it has again to do with pressure. Um, I want you to think for a moment. Have you ever been into an old store or an old building that had either old linoleum floors or an old wooden floor? And notice the floor has pockmarks in it, like little divots. If you have, have you ever wondered where those come from? The short answer is ladies. I'm not picking on them for anything. It's their shoes. Yeah, the shoes. Uh, especially high heels. Okay, let's put it this way. Let's imagine, for the sake of argument, that both of my feet put together measure up one square foot. Okay, how many square inches are in a square foot? Well, if you do the math real quick, I know a little bit of math, 12 by 12, 12 inches long, 12 inches wide, multiply 12 by 12, you should get 144. Okay. So, let's say for the sake of argument, to keep the math simple, I weigh 288 pounds. It's not my weight, thankfully, but let's just say it is. Now, if I stand with both feet flat on the floor, how much pressure am I putting on the ground? Well, if we go back to the definition of pressure being force per unit area, and we consider that weight is a measure of force, it's a measure of the force that uh, the mass of your body puts on or creates because of the gravitational pull of the earth, then we take 288 and divide it by 144. And we get to, right, 2 pounds per square inch. 
Not a lot of pressure, it seems, right? Okay. Now, let's imagine for the sake of argument, and to some degree comedy, that I am wearing a pair of stiletto high heels. Yes, I did say stiletto high heels. I don't care if they're the six inch ones or the nine inch ones, doesn't matter. Stiletto high heels. And let's just say for the sake of argument that the heel area on each heel is one quarter inch by one quarter inch. Okay, can you picture that? All right. Now, if let's walk this through slowly. So if barefoot, I'm standing and both feet are one square, or my feet in total are one square foot on the ground, standing, I put two pounds per square inch. If I lift one foot, I leave half a square foot on the ground, then I double my pressure to, right, four pounds per square inch. It's not a lot. But if I do it with the set of stiletto heels, what is that going to do to the pressure? Well, let's think about it. I said that the area of the stiletto heel is one quarter inch by one quarter inch. So if you do the math on that, one quarter times one quarter, you get that the area is one sixteenth of a square inch. Okay? Now, if it's force per unit area, that would be the force, which is my weight, 288 divided by 1 16th, right? All right, if you don't know this trick, it's real simple. If you're dividing by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the inverse of that fraction. So that's going to equal 288 times 16 over 1, okay? Or 288 times 16, which is going to give us... Um, A grand total of 4,608 make that a little better pounds per square inch. Two tons per square inch of force. Okay? Now imagine what that does to a floor. That explains the pockmarks. Um, back when I was in grad school at uh, Brown University, there was a story that came out I think it was maybe my second semester there. Um, or maybe the first semester. I can't remember which exactly. But there had been a uh, party at one of the yacht clubs in the area. Uh, the Providence, the Brown University is in Providence, Rhode Island, for those that don't know. It may have been in Newport. I don't remember exactly where. But uh, basically, long story short, this uh, lady was at the party feeling a little lightheaded, stepped outside to get some fresh air onto the deck. Um, somebody walked up behind her. He grabbed her, started feeling her up, and was saying all the things he was going to do to her. She picked up her foot and stomped on his foot. She was wearing a pair of stiletto heels. He screamed and let go of her. She kicked off her heels and ran for it. Found a phone. Back in the day before there were cell phones, so she had to go find a pay phone called the cops. The cops showed up 20 minutes or 30 minutes later. The perp was still there. Not because he was stupid enough to hang around, but because he was literally nailed to the spot. When she stomped on, her, on his foot as hard as she could with her heel, it penetrated his foot. The rod that's in the heel, there's a metal rod in those heels to make them stable, went through his foot into the wood, penetrated the wood by something like an inch, if I remember the story correctly, hit a bolt in the deck, and it bent over. So it bent like that. So he was effectively nailed to the spot. He could not move. They actually had to cut the deck out to get him out of the area so they could take him to the ER and get the shoe removed from his foot. Um, so, yeah, ladies, your heels are dangerous weapons. Okay, But now, let's think about this for a moment. What is that going to do? Well, what is that type of pressure going to really do? In some cases, it does some weird things. If you have material that's soft enough, differential pressure, 
which would be the case of me pressing down on this, is going to bend it. Makes sense, right? Okay. But what about something harder? Um, this will work. Battery charger for my camera. If I put a lot of pressure on this in this direction, squeezing my two hands, what's going to happen? Well, you could say nothing, but if I do it right, it rotated. Okay, This is because materials want to align themselves with the pressure. And what they really want to do is they want to align themselves in a manner as to reduce the force the pressure is putting on them. So what they will do is they will align so that the greatest surface area is perpendicular to the greatest force. This is what causes those minerals to align. So again, if I have my box with flaky minerals in it, or my rock with flaky minerals in it that are like this, and I put a lot of pressure vertically on it and very little pressure sideways, the result is going to be a box that gets thinned out and everything lines up so that we get this orientation of those flat mineral grains in perpendicular to the greatest pressure. Okay, This is what causes foliation to occur within metamorphic rocks. So this is what's going to cause it. Now, in terms of the types of foliation, we're going to move from the foliation that occurs at the low end of the metamorphic spectrum and move to the stuff that occurs at the high end of the metamorphic spectrum. So at the low end of the spectrum, we have what is called rock or slaty cleavage, S-L-A-T-Y. This is basically where we have closely spaced uh, planes within the rock or planar surfaces along which the rock will break or split. This is generally developed because of microscopic minerals like micas that are all lining up. And remember, mica is pretty weak in that one plane that it cleaves along, so it allows those materials to break easily in that direction. Now, generally speaking, um, this can develop in a number of different ways depending on the composition and the type of environment that we're in. But generally speaking, more often than not, it's going to be microscopic micas or chlorides. Those are the two most common. Um, but they're microscopic. And so what this means is that when we look at this broken surface, not really going to be that shiny. It's not going to be bright. It's not going to be highly reflective. Now, if the micas get large enough, um, we won't see them, but we'll see a kind of glossy sheen off of the rock. And that's actually a very specific type of rock that that creates. And it's an in-between stage. And we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, but beyond that, if the minerals get large enough to be seen and the rock is breaking along these, mineral these uh, planes of minerals, then we call that schistosity. I'll write that uh, or spell that out for you. S-C-H-I-S-O-S-I-T-Y. Schist. It's a great word. Um, but it's these platy minerals that are discernible to the naked eye, so they're large enough to be able to be seen and, and usually recognized that are in planes or layers, and the rock is going to break along those planes and layers. Um, anything that has that texture is going to be referred to as a schist. And generally speaking, as we'll see in a moment, we basically will refer to it based on its composition. The next higher form is what we call Nisic banding, G-N-E-I-S-S-I-C, for, stands for nice. That first rock I showed you, that has Nisic banding. That is the compositional banding. So you have la alternating layers of mafic and felsic material. So you have this segregation that is occurring of minerals. So literally the dark minerals are going with the dark minerals, the light minerals are going with the light minerals. So we get this banded appearance. Now we can get some other 
uh, pyroclastic, or not pyroclastic, I don't know why I said pyroclastic, but other metamorphic textures that are out there. Generally speaking, the non-foliated, where everything is equidimensional crystals, uh, it's basically just a recrystallized material, so we just call it non-foliated. That's, again, like marble, quartzite, those are some prime examples for it. We can also get what's called a porphoblastic texture. Um, porphoblast is the name we give to a mineral grain that grows within a metamorphic rock, but grows to be much larger than everything else in the rock. Um, generally speaking, things like garnets or starlights are going to be very common for this. Uh, and we call it a porphoblastic texture. And of course, we give the name to the of the porphoblast. So it's a garnet uh, mica schist or a, a starlight mica schist, things of that nature. So in terms of the common metamorphic rocks, uh, we start with the foliated rocks. We start with the, the first rock. Let's say we take a shale, one of the more common uh, ignea or sedimentary rocks that we talked about last time, and we metamorphose it. We're going to turn it into slate. Uh, slate is tougher. It breaks easier and flatter, ha has flatter planes and breaks where the slate is a fissile material where it will split, but it's going to split across different layers and whatnot. The slate is going to split cl more cleanly and in single, tend to be in uh, nice flat layers. Um... It tends to have excellent rock cleavage. Generally speaking, it's low-grade metamorphism, mudstone, siltstone, shale, those materials. The next up is phyllite. Now, phyllite is that stage where the mineral grains in the slate are getting larger, so they create this reflective sheen, this glossy sheen. And sometimes the surface can be wavy, but it's still the grains are going to be too small to see. So it's that glossy sheen that really sets it apart. And the rock is still going to have a lot of very good rock cleavage. It's going to break along. Um, generally speaking, this is going to form from a, a slate. So we move from slate to phyllite. So everything we're talking about right now actually can come from the rock before it. So if we cook it more, we make those uh, platy minerals, whether they're muscovite mica or biotite mica or chlorite or a combination thereof, and we make those minerals large enough to be seen, now we're into a schist. Generally speaking, general two types of schist are mica schist, either uh, a mica schist, a straight mica schist is a mixture of biotite and muscovite. You can have a muscovite mica schist, you can have a biotite mica schist, or you can have a chlorite mica schist. And chlorite is going gonna to be a material very similar to talc. feels about the same. Um, and the schist basically is just referring to the texture. So the composition gives us the name. And if we have a porphoblast, then we throw the porphoblast name in first. So we have a garnet mica schist, or a garnet muscovite mica schist. And then, of course, we have a nice. And the nice uh, is usually medium to coarse grained. Um, so schist could be considered roughly fine grained to medium grained. Uh, it, the nice is banded. It has that compositional banding. Now, it doesn't have to be distorted like the picture in the book shows. It can be nice flat layers. It can be distorted also. Uh, generally speaking, the lighter colored layers are either going to be white to reddish in color because depending on the nature of their composition i.e are we talking about uh what type of feldspars are in there and then we have the dark layers now there is one more in this that we can have but it's kind of a it's kind of a weird rock it's a half and half rock and we call it a migmatite m-i-g-m-i-t-i-t-e a migmatite is a rock that got so hot under so much heat and pressure that it partially melted. And in this case, it's the light layers, the, the felsic layers that melted. The mafic layers did not. So what you'll tend to see that is that will help you identify a migmatite, if you ever see one, and you'll see one in the lab maybe, is that the black layers, the dark layers, will show foliation but the light layers will not. So that is the key di diagnostic for a migmatite. The light layers are not foliated, the dark layers are. Okay? 
in terms of the non-foliated metamorphic rocks, um, there's only a couple that you really need to know about. In fact, two to be exact. Um, one is a marble. Uh, that's basically metamorphosed limestone. It basically the crystals have been recrystallized in the limestone, usually bigger, stronger interlocking, so it's a tougher, slightly tougher material. Um, it can actually occur in very different colors depending on what's in the rock to begin with. And then quartzite. Quartzite is basically a fused sandstone, so it's like a sandstone that got cooked together and turned into a solid object. Um, a key factor of distinguishing sandstone from quartzite is very simple. In a sandstone, you will, if you break the rock, you're going to break around the grains. So you're going to break the bond between the grains in a sandstone. In a quartzite, because everything is fused together, you're more likely to break through grains than you are going to break around the grains. So uh, if you look at a, sands, a, a quartzite surface that's broken, you should see the individual quartz grains, and each of those have a, a uh, conchoidal fracture surface on them. Now, uh, in terms of the metamorphic environments that you can find, again, uh, they're going to be associated with three different types of primary environments. You're going to have the the contact environment where basically you're going to have a rise in temperature due to a magma body that's coming up into the material or a lava body flowing on it. Uh, you're going to see some degree of mineral composition change because of that heat. You're generally speaking not going to see much in the way of foliation though uh, because there's not enough pressure to cause that foliation to occur. Um, Hydrothermal metamorphism, kind of the same thing. You're going to see a change in composition of the, in terms of the mineral content that's there, but you're not going to see a lot of a change in foliation or orientation of materials. Um, the slight difference between hydrothermal and contact is hydrothermal is really hot fluid circulating through cracks and fissures in the rock. So an interesting thing that you can get with a hydrothermal is the outside, the areas where the, the areas close to the cracks or the outside of the rocks where the fluid was circulating is going to be changed, but the, air, the rock on the inside is not. So you get this kind of like a, a cooked zone, if you will, uh, a, a baking zone, if you will, on it. And then there's regional metamorphism, which produces the greatest amount of metamorphic rocks in the world today. That's from mountain building events. So when we get the big tectonic events, like when India slammed into Asia and slammed under Asia, uh, part of India is now about 2,000 kilometers under, in, uh, under Asia. And I don't mean under this way, I mean under this way. Um, that creates a lot of metamorphic material. Um, in fact, we actually are able to use these belts of metamorphic material that we can find around the world to identify places where there used to be mountain ranges. Those mountain ranges are long since worn away, but we have the bottom of the root structure of those mountains left, and so we can tell where they were. And to a degree, by based on the amount of metamorphism, the type of metamorphism that we see there, we can actually calculate how deep that material had to have been to be that hot, and then calculate how tall those mountain ranges had to have been. Now, there's other forms of metamorphism that we can get into. Those, are the, those three are the main type. Uh, one is burial. Remember when we were talking about sedimentary rocks? I mentioned how uh, sedimentary rocks are only found in the upper 16 kilometers or roughly 10 miles of the crust of the Earth. Well, this is because if you bury rocks below that depth, uh, you're going to get into what we call burial metamorphism. You're just buried so deep that the rocks are going to change. The ambient heat and pressure at that depth is going to change the rocks. No question about it. We can also see metamorphism along fault zones. Um, we haven't talked much about faults yet, but when we do have a fault zone, you can get a lot of pressure and some degree of frictional heating that occurs in there, and you can create metamorphic rocks. The most common of which is uh, something called a myelinite. Um, I don't have a sample of it, so don't look for it in the lab, but it, it creates a very interesting rock. It's usually down at a depth where you get to a point where the heating in the earth from the geothermal gradient and the pressure allows a more ductile form of 
change in the in the material so you get this kind of ductile flow along the along the fault boundary and this creates this formation uh, and then lastly there's impact metamorphism uh, impact metamorphism of course is going to occur when you have a high speed collision i.e. asteroid meteorite comet hits the earth um, this can create all sorts of interesting materials generally creates what we call an impact tiles um, it can create shatter cones which are a very unique form of metamorphism uh, basically you get these co conical structures of, of shattering within the rocks it can also create, a, create what we call shocked quartz which has a very distinctive view now generally speaking um, when we look at metamorphic rocks again going back to this idea that we can have this gradual change we do see the systematic variation of of textures and minerals in rocks we can look at these and create what we call uh, index minerals and metamorphic grade so we can use the changes in mineralogy to look at how we're changing regimes from low grade metamorphism to high grade metamorphism uh, we can look at me certain minerals or index minerals meaning they're going to form under specific pressure temperature conditions and so we can use those to figure out what the range of pressure and temperature the rock had undergone. The more index minerals that are in the rock, the more we can look for how all of them overlap. And that, that sliver of overlap that they create tells us pretty much the exact nature of the pressure and temperature the rock actually formed under. Uh, just looking at your book, um, in relationship to plate tectonics, um, when we think about these different forms of metamorphism, uh, what we'll see is that most of the hydrothermal metamorphism is going to occur along the uh, spreading ridges, the places where the plates are pulling apart. Um, we'll see in seismic zones a lot of it, metamorphism associated with uh, fault systems such as the transform boundaries where the plates are slipping past each other or in subduction zones where one plate is subducting under we'll see some degree of that but usually in a subduction zone that's where you're going to get uh, more of your regional metamorphism that can occur as well as some degree of hydrothermal metamorphism if you have a, a hydrothermal area that develops for it um, you know, so most of the metamorphism occurs along those convergent boundaries. So, you know, places like the Andes, the Himalayas, the Appalachians, the Urals, the uh, Atlas Mountains, you know, things like that, the Alps. Uh, so we're going to see it. Um, part of this is also going to show us some of the, the conditions that end up leading towards magma formation within them. And again, we can we can use this material to look back and in part try to work out some of the history of the Earth. So when we come back um, next week or week after next week, since I'm recording this on Thursday, uh, we're going to do labs five and six. We're going to do igneous or sedimentary rocks, and then we're going to do metamorphic rocks. Um, I'm going to try to split this up so that. You, the whole lab will take one for both will take about one class period I hope knock on wood we'll work this out if I need to give you a little more time we'll work out a time to do that maybe offer up the ability to do that say after the midterm um, but you'll have a, a few samples of rock and you're gonna have to make some decisions with them and so with that I will bid you adieu for tonight this will again this was uh, chapter 7 igneous rock or metamorphic rocks and metamorphism and uh, i'll see you guys later i'll get uh, the other two done uh, time and geology and mass wasting so have a good night